Welcome viewers to the series Exploring Careers in Technology's New Frontiers. This episode is titled Creating Therapies to Treat Diseases Using Predictive Artificial Intelligence and Robotics. My name is Lizette Lucero, class of 2021 at Middlebury College, and I would like to introduce this episode's guest speaker. I am joined today by Robert Skiff, class of 90. Robert is the CEO and founder of 3852.ai. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Robert. Thanks for having me. So, Robert, the series explores a number of different professional areas involved in new frontiers in technology. Tell us a little bit about your organization and what you do in your role. 3852 is a predictive artificial intelligence, robotics, and design of experiment, automated design of experiments company. We develop five to seven combination drugs for the treatments of various diseases. My role as CEO is basically working with uh, the lawyers, the scientists, um, financiers to make the company successful um, by hiring people and, and um, helping the scientists and the computer scientists produce the technology that will allow us to find these uh, combination drug treatments. And uh, so where does your t uh, company fit in within the technology field? So uh, one of our founders is uh, Norman Packard, a pioneer in both um, artificial intelligence and complex adaptive systems. Uh, what we're doing is basically applying his artificial intelligence to some really complex, uh, uh, complex space, which is, uh, again, combination drug treatments for uh, a variety of cancers. And we're targeting breast cancer as the first uh, treatment that we're going to be, the first disease we're developing a treatment for. And so what does the current and future landscape in your company look like? So it's been really fun working the past, working for the past sort of uh, year and a half on developing this idea. And, and now we're uh, seeking uh, Series A funding. Um, we've developed the AI, um, created the robot, um, designed the robot, um, you know, recruited a team, dealt with the legal framework, the uh, patents, et cetera. Um, you know, the future is, you know, pretty exciting because using artificial intelligence in, in drug discovery is on the cutting edge. Um, and especially the artificial intelligence that, that we use, which is helps to, um, in the design of experiments to automate that process. So that instead of having with drug companies, they use a thing called high throughput experimental design where they search through all possible combinations to arrive at, a, um, at an answer. Our AI literally learns as it's doing the experiments in that explorable space. I think that um, AI and robotics and automation is a cutting field in a variety of different areas, both from material sciences to uh, synthetic biology. Uh, and it's an area that hasn't been you know, explored too much um, in terms of the automation of uh, DOE. There's been a lot of work being done in in creating large databases and searching for um, information by textual analysis and et cetera, but to really implement it, embed it into the um, experiment, the design of experiments process itself is something that uh, um, hasn't really happened before or has happened very rarely. So just think of RAI as an incredibly smart scientist who can see in dimensions that, that human beings just can't. And uh, that's kind of what we do. So what do you find most interesting about you know, robotics and artificial intelligence uh, combined? Well, I, there's a bunch of different um, things that are incredibly interesting about it. One is the application that it has to drug discovery um, and also uh, you know, the development of smart materials and synthetic biology. Um, automating using robotics to automate the experiment, the experimental process means that there's much better standardization about results. Um, you know, when humans are involved in using the instrumentation um, of, uh, you know, putting, you know, certain amounts of drug and measuring, you know, the classic sort of bench work, you have errors that are created. And those errors um, 
can have a big impact on the experimental results. When you're able to automate a process using robots and, and you know, um, liquid handling devices and all kinds of other particular pieces, you are able to track when there are um, changes in the environment or in the process and, and make the standardization a whole lot easier to um, accomplish, which then means that scientists are spending their time thinking about new, uh, new things they want to create or experiment or explore instead of having to spend the time um, you know, using, you know, doing bench work. And bench work is important, but um, standardization is, is uh, super important also. And you know, as the, as the instrumentation becomes more and more sophisticated, and as you can automate it with companies like uh, BioCero uh, and uh, with the use of their uh, GBG um, software processes, you just get a much, much better um, result. So now most of the PCR test results for COVID-19 are being done on machines, you know, and some of the machines are from, you know, uh, created by BioCero and other tech companies to automate that testing process. So you, you get better results and you get better data and larger data and you free the creative people, the scientists into the work that they're supposed to do, which is uh, coming up with great new ideas and new, new, um, new things to develop. And what do you believe are the biggest challenges that currently exist in artificial intelligence with regards to healthcare? The most interesting feature about AI and robotics is how the areas where it's been applied to is still relatively small. I think we're in a situation that is a lot like, you know, back in 92, 93, 94, when the internet um, was coming online, there were all kinds of different um, businesses, industries, changes in the way in which we interact and, and do science back when the internet was first available and you could track down pretty much any kind of article you wanted. Well, today we're in that same situation. We're just at the beginning of a real change um, where we're applying skills from several different fields and seeing how they can work together to really push um, the science and the technology forward. And so, for example, the, the things that we do with predictive AI and, and robotics wasn't even possible um, a year ago. The technology wasn't out there and the, uh, the software to integrate the different systems together was not out there. Uh, and now it is. And so I'm just, you know, it's gonna be really, really interesting to see the, you know, the proliferation that happens. And, and in material science, in synthetic biology, and in all kinds of different diseases, and in you know, and how this gets you know used in nanotechnology and and uh, you know and things like that. So it's the perfect time to be sort of you know twenty twenty one, graduating you know with a a BA or a BS, and then wanting to you know delve into this work without potentially even going on to to um, to grad school. Yeah, it's uh, definitely becoming a lot more accessible um, for, I guess, startups to be able to even have that opportunity. Um, and, you know, everyone, I mean, I would hope that a lot of people who can, who have these skills would want to move into such a field um, and in a way impact the lives of many other people. Um, and so, as you may know, uh, there exists bias in healthcare and in artificial intelligence algorithms. So how has this impacted your organization and what are some steps that you have taken to reduce it or, um, you know, just be uh, conscious of that? Our AI is different than big data trained AI. We're exploring a, a particular space of possibilities and automating the design of experiments. So there isn't, with predictive artificial intelligence, there's no inherent bias because we're not using databases um, to train our AI with. The AI learns as it runs, as it goes through and is running the experiments. That being said, in the area of healthcare, um, we are using live cell assays uh, of different cancer cell lines and 
the vast majority of those cancer cell lines are from Southern and Northern Europeans. And that has a, that can have a big impact on how the drug combinations interact with the cancer. We would like to have more and a much more diverse set of cell lines that are representative of the global community. Um, and we're going to be working to do that, but you know, we're not at the stage where we can do things like that, um, you know, in terms of our funding, et cetera. But we've already had discussions with people. One of the big issues that, that is important to look at is the BRCA um, genes in cancer um, that primarily impact um, the Ashkenazi uh, Jewish population. And there are something like six uh, or eight potential cell lines to um, run, you know, these um, optimization combination treatment pieces on, and we'd like a whole lot more, but, you know, that's, again, that's a tricky piece. And there's also some, you know, issues methodologically with it that, you know, you have to be um, concerned about. But great question. And so what are some other challenges uh, you might encounter working in uh, your organization or even the role that you're currently in? Well, there's always, there's always challenges. I think the biggest one is, you know, making sure that as a leader that you take care of your team and that you're um, supporting them in what they're doing. Uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you have a real clarity of purpose and mission and what you wanna get accomplished, and you fit everything around clarity of mission, then things become easier. That being said, there's always, you know, there's always static, um, you know, working with different, uh, um, different groups and different, uh, um, you know, the lawyers and the financiers and the scientists and um, all speak very different languages. And so having to translate between those groups is a really important skill to develop. Um, and, and that can be a challenge. Um, and, uh, but, and also, especially today, you need to uh, empower um, people at all levels to uh, be innovative and to not fear, not fear bad news or failure. Um, you know, when you're innovating and you're trying to create something brand new, you're always going to have, you know, some things that don't go okay. You're always going to have some bumps in the road. And what you have to do is, uh, is make sure that the people who are working with you and for you, if there's a failure, um, if, if something goes wrong, that you, um, you fix it and they feel comfortable telling you that, hey, this didn't work out very well without feeling any kind of, of pressure or, or a sense that there's going to be retribution for that. I um, mean, that's, that's a leadership piece. And yep. So that's, that's kind of from where I sit, you know, that's the, the challenge that, you know, that I have. Thank you for sharing uh, these insights. So um, I'm also curious about your own experience from campus to career. So at mid, you majored in history and Buddhism. Um, so tell us how you got from that to, you know, funding uh, or founding this uh, company that's based on artificial intelligence, robotics, and healthcare. <laughs> okay, so mine is, not, mine is not the atypical story. Mine is not the typical story for people who graduated in the last century, okay? <laughs> um, and so I majored in history and Buddhism. I then, uh, you know, my career path was going down to um, Ecuador teaching history and uh, uh, philosophy at, at, uh, at Colegio Americano de Quito for two years coming back to the States, starting a school um, with, my, uh, with a member of the class of 95, um, who was my wife at the time, Leah Mattel, and my dad. It's called Vermont Common School and it's located in South Burlington, Vermont. And I worked there and then kind of, you know, worked there for, worked on that for 15 years teaching. Now you might say, how does teaching and, and doing a startup have anything to do with um, the AI? But I think it, it really pushes you on the soft skills. Um, you have the ability today with the internet to learn and go in depth with practically any subject. You know, you can download the peer reviewed journal articles, you can, um, you know, read the textbook 
books. You can learn about all kinds of different things. And that was not available in 1990 when I graduated. And those soft skills of working with kids with different um, learning needs and, and uh, you know, learning challenges and people from different classes and races at a school really prepares you very, very well for forming teams in a business. Um, because you learn very quickly how to explain things in the simplest way possible. Um, and if you're the school VCS um, in its you know, early years and continuing now, I mean, we did computer modeling with, this, with the students, um, a thing called system dynamics. We, were, we taught all the subjects within the, within the context of the environment, which included um, you know, science, math, language arts, all with and social sciences, which was what I taught within that context. We engaged in the world by you know, creating um, uh, partnership agreements in China and with schools and colleges there. So you, it was a really great training ground to be able to work in that, in that area. And when I went back to graduate school, I originally thought I was going to be um, you know, uh, some sort of education professor at a college or university and started, a, um, started an online learning company. And when I was a VCS, I started a foreign exchange um, you know, trading company using basic types of uh, statistical and AI um, to trace the Euro dollar flows. Um, so always being sort of like innovative and kind of like pushing myself and, and learning about things that I didn't necessarily have a strong background in, but, but diving into it. And, and then I got involved in some consulting um, after I got my doctorate in policy and, and uh, what was it, policy and, and finance at the University of Vermont uh, for an educational doctorate. And then met Norman Packard, who was one of my heroes uh, when I was created that foreign exchange company in uh, the year 2000. I read Norman's book called The Predictors. And when I met him um, in Chicago uh, three years ago, uh, we started working together and uh, then, you know, learning from Norman and then coming up with this idea uh, of uh, combination drug treatments and robotics and cancer. Uh, we spent a lot of time proofing that and then recruiting a really amazing team, you know, Colin Walter and, and Dana Reed. Um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty spectacular team to make this happen. And now we're just you know, plugging along as we, uh, you know, do as much simulation work as we can uh, um, to uh, raise the money for the uh, robot and to actually run the experiments to create these new um, kinds of treatments that we, they're really going to have an impact on, uh, on breast cancer and other types of cancer. So, um, you know, you always need to be able to innovate, to take chances, to fail, and to then innovate again. And hopefully that is what, you know, the students um, now in their classes are being encouraged to do. Was there a defining moment that helped you decide that you wanted to start your company? The biggest defining moment was when I was on, um, when I like to, when I need to think, I generally go for a run, mm -hmm. okay, a, a run, a long one, um, sometimes trail running. And we were, we had had a meeting down in Boston with uh, Pfizer and we were showing them how our predictive AI could, could, was really much better than the methods they were using in terms of their high throughput experimental design and had data to all back that up. And I said, well, gosh, if, if we're really good at exploring these unknown spaces with these complex, you know, in, in these complex disease, with these complex diseases, why couldn't we do it with, um, you know, using uh, FDA approved drugs with cancer, it just sort of popped into my mind. And a friend of mine got, uh, has the BRCA gene and was diagnosed at age 38 is probably going to develop cancer at some point in her life. Well, she did develop cancer and at 
age 52 is cancer free. And so that's sort of where the name comes from. But the event that caused me to say that this needed to be done was having that, you know, going on that long run and thinking, wow, we could, ex why can't we, you know, create uh, combination drugs to create synergistic effects with these, with what are called mechanisms of action in cancer? Why couldn't we explore that? Why, you know, Pfizer, Merck, and the big pharma companies aren't, you know, they, it's not economical for them to do it. You know, it's, we're searching through a space of, you know, 2.4 billion possible combinations. Uh, but we can find these, um, we can use Norman's AI and find these um, in, you know, 20, 30,000 experiments instead of, you know, a huge number. Uh, that's important, you know, 415 women die a day of breast cancer in the US, could we make that number go down? In addition, the cost of cancer therapy, especially in you know, Latin America, Africa, South Asia, and in China is incredibly high. So you have um, women who are dying of the disease when maybe we could come up with a cheaper and better alternative. And so, you know, it's a problem you see it in front of you and then you need to solve it. And then, you know, from there, thinking of all the different other kinds of ways in which the predictive AI could, you know, the predictive AI and the robotics could impact things. And so that, I'd say that that was probably the moment is on a run um, when I was growing, you know, when you're a little bit frustrated, you know, with, with what's going on and then you can say, hey, I can, I can do it, you know, I can do it better. And you just have to, you know, just be willing to take that chance. So what role, if any, um, do you feel that advanced degrees play in uh, this space? That's another really great question. I think advanced degrees um, play a huge role. Uh, they play a huge role definitely for Gen X and I think for the millennials. Um, it is tough to figure out over the next 15 to 20 years about whether an advanced degree um, is going to be worth, what type of advanced degree is worth pursuing. In STEM fields, I think it's extremely important to pursue. Um, I think there's phenomenal training that you get at a tier, at a top tier university uh, in, you know, getting your PhD in engineering and, and medicine and anything having to do with the you know the hard sciences so given uh your experiences and what you know now uh what advice would you give current students on how to best prepare themselves for entry points into this career field i would say get i would say number one things are changing so quickly and think we're in a real transformational period that that people who are older than you are are still existing in the paradigm of a world that doesn't necessarily exist anymore. And so I would say that if you want to get into these fields, then you know, get into them by either finding a job in it or creating your own company. And you know, you're going to go through um, several different iterations uh, you're going to have some successes and some failures. You know, you have to have the ability to, you know, of course, feed yourself. And unfortunately, for a lot of people, they got to, you know, spend a bunch of money paying off their student loans and, and taking care of family and all of that. Um, but I would say just do it. Um, you know, if you, if you want to pursue something, uh, reach out to your network of friends and, you know, and, and yes, use the Middlebury Alumni Network. But you know, if, if you craft a really well, well done email and you send it out to a company with your resume and then you call them back and you, you call them back so many times until they finally say, no, we're sick of you. Okay. That's when you stop. Um, you keep pushing. And, you know, again, the friends that you have from your high school, from your college, the friends in your community, you guys can get together and you can create 
some amazingly innovative company and then pull in the people and the resources you need to make that successful. So you may not, in your group, you may not have the PhD in, in um, oncology, but you can certainly find someone who does. Uh, if you're not good at a particular kind of engineering, you can pull in somebody who is. Uh, don't wait for, the, the path is undefined right now. And the older people have never lived through anything like this in terms of the changes. And so they're not necessarily a great guide for how to create this new paradigm or what's gonna best serve you. So just, you know, try a bunch of stuff and rely on your friends, rely on your community. That's the way to do it. That was some very good advice. Um, I do, I think Middlebury is definitely setting up. Um, we have something called the Innovation Hub now. Yep. Um, which, you know, encourages uh, students to innovate and provides the space for them and funding um, for them to kind of get with their group of friends and start doing something. And it, a lot of great ideas have come out of Middlebury, which is something that I really, really love um, and hope, you know, expands even more so in the future. Uh, so, Robert, thank you again for your engagement with us in helping students to prepare for their first career destinations. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It was, uh, it was really fun and interesting and I wish you the best um, on your search and I'm very excited to read about you in the future. Thank you. So this concludes our uh, episode within the series, Exploring Careers in Technologies, New Frontiers. In closing, I want to encourage viewers to tune in to get career perspectives and advice from a number of professionals in a broad variety of organizations in our other episodes in this series. I also want to encourage you to tune in to the other MidVantage series, which can be accessed through the events and programs tab on the CCI website. Thanks again for watching. <laughs>